Hi there. Okay, well welcome and we're going to talk about characteristics of living things. So as you can see from this slide, living things, there's all sorts of them and what we want you to do in this lecture is be able to really focus in on what makes something living. Now when I talk about living, I'm not talking about living or dead. That distinction is different. What we're talking about is things that were living or are living versus or being versus things that uh, never had life in them. So it's not alive or dead, it's living versus non-living. So that's the key to this. The first characteristic that we're going to focus on is that uh, in order to be living, something needs to ha be made of one or more cells. So in this slide you can see we have blood cells, onion skin epidural cells, and human cheek cells. So when it comes to blood cells, those would be the smallest cells that exist in the human body and they're so small that they don't even have a nucleus. Then we have cells such as the plant cells of the onion skin and you can see that structure. This, types of, this type of structure indicates something that is living. And then here we have the nucleus of a cheek cell. When we talk about living things ha being made of cells, we can either talk about them being unicellular or multicellular. Una, if for those of you taking Spanish, it looks a lot like uno, of course, and means one, like a unicycle has one wheel. So unicellular, having one cell. And those are organisms that their entire structure as an individual is one cell. And some examples of those are bacteria, all of the bacteria, they are all unicellular, as well as there are some single-celled fungi such as yeast, which we use of course to make bread. Multicellular, on the other hand, multi meaning multiple or made of more. Um, so those would be things that you need multiple cells to have one organism. Of course, humans fit into that category. We are made of obviously many, many, many more than one, and we'll be talking about just how many cells we're made of later on. Um, then we have other, um, many other living things that are made of multiple cells. The second characteristic of living things is that they display a level of organization. So here on the slide you can see this level. We have atoms. When you put atoms together, you get a molecule. You put molecules together, you get cells. You get cells together, you get tissues. You put tissues together, you get organs. You put organs together, you get organ systems. You put organ systems together, you get organisms. And by the time you put organisms together, you get the biosphere. Well, as you can see, this is all describing this this hierarchy or leveling of living things. And starting with the atom and molecules, and this is where we're going to start our semester too, with this small scale um, aspects of living things. The third characteristic of living things that we're going to be looking at are the fa is the fact that living things grow and develop. So living things um, if we want to think of something that's living, let's take mm, a blade of grass or grass. And obviously grass gets taller. We, you'll have people out there mowing it because it gets taller and taller. The AstroTurf or turf that they've put on the football field on campus here, now that doesn't grow and you'll notice there obviously is no lawn mower that is necessary out there because it is not growing. It is synthetic, meaning it is man-made. And these things do not grow. And develop means you have stages. So you go from one stage in a life cycle to another stage. And all different organisms have life cycles. We'll be talking about these life cycles as we go on in the semester. Now, again, we'll take our astroturf. That astroturf doesn't have any cycle that is a given cycle in its in due to um, things that are going on in a so-called body because it doesn't have one so it you know it wears out but that's just a breakdown a structural breakdown of the cells whereas 
um, I'm sorry, of the, not of the cells, of the uh, atoms. Whereas for cells, we actually, cells live and they die and they regenerate. And so we end up having that. So uh, this increase in cell size or cell number, that is this growth and development. And um, another thing that's important here is differentiation. So cells specialization for a certain job. And so as you, they get older, these jobs may not function as well, and that's where aging takes place. So this process is unique to living things. The fourth characteristic is reproduction. And reproduction is making new living organisms that are of what you already are. So there are two kinds. There is asexual reproduction, and that means that you only need one organism to make two. And in the picture here, you can see that there was one bacterial cell, and that has now um, gone through a division by which it now is two cells. And it did not require another cell to come and, and share any genetic information for it to become uh, more than one. So that is asexual reproduction. A means without, so without sex or, or sharing of genetic material. The second kind, and this is what humans are familiar with, is sexual reproduction. And this is where it takes two individuals of um, of one kind to make the offspring or, or the children of that, um, that particular species. The fifth characteristic of living things, as we're going to divide it into that, um, is responding to stimulus. So what is stimulus? What does that mean? Well, stimulus can be sight, sound, touch, pressure, temperature, chemicals, color, light. It can be a lot of different things. Let's use an example. So if I have a rock and I scream really loudly at that rock, does the rock do anything? No, because the rock does not respond to stimulus. The rock just sits there. Now, on the other hand, if I have a sow bug, a little bug, and I scream really loudly, you might see that that little, little roly-poly might crawl away. It's going to respond to the threat of a giant human yelling at it. So this is not also the case for light. If you've ever seen um, sunflowers, a field of sunflowers, their heads will all go round and round depending on the direction of the sun. And they, the whole head of the sunflower will face the direction of the sun. That's how they got their names, responding to the stimulus of light. And so there are all types of things that it plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, um, protozoans will all respond to and this is a uh, key to understanding that they are all living. The rock on the other hand not being living does not respond to these. The sixth characteristic of living thing is the fact that living things obtain and use energy. Whether you're bacteria or you're a chimpanzee you are going to use energy and you do that through metabolism. Cells, regardless if it's a single-celled organism or a multi-celled multi organism, have a metabolism. And they have a set of chemical reactions that take place. So they are able to get, get the energy and then use that energy. So this is uh, a pretty important process. There are two types of, or major categories, when we think of how metabolism works. And the first one is heterotrophic. Hetero, meaning different, and meaning feeding on others. Okay, so if we think of humans, where do we get our energy from? And we all know we get that from eating. Well, we don't eat, um, literally we don't eat ourselves. We don't, we don't get our energy from inter an internal process. We have to kill a plant, a mushroom, uh, uh, a, a cow, something to get some other thing to get our energy and thus we are heterotrophic and all animals are heterotrophic um, and so that that is a, a, big, a big part of being an animal. 
On the other hand, and many of you probably are familiar with this, the other way of obtaining energy is autotrophic. Auto, like being automatic, uh, referring to self, um, or, um, yeah, so referring to self. And so these organisms would be plants. Plants are autotrophic. In other words, they produce their own energy through the process of photosynthesis. Number seven in characteristics of living things is living things maintain homeostasis. Stasis refers to status and homeo being a sameness. So they have the same status. And this is a regulation of organisms' internal structure. In chemistry, the, like when you take a chemistry class in school, you will be oftentimes in a situation where you'll you know, things will burn up and thing uh, and that type of thing, and that kind of spontaneous combustion. These are things that we do hope in the biological world do not happen, because your body. Let's think about humans here. You don't want to get too cold or too hot. If you're too cold, you get hypothermia. That's something you can die from. If you're too hot, you get a fever. Fevers, of course, people can die from. Um, either way, those are where the body has spun out of control and is not is no longer maintaining what we call homeostasis. Homeostasis would be that middle ground of, of, of um, temperature that our body requires to effectively ha do the chemical processes that are necessary for the human body to function normally. So if as our body gets hot, we sweat in response to that to cool down the body, bring down the temperature. When we get cold, we shiver in hopes of warming up the body again. So that process, those are all automatic things that happen to, so that to help the body maintain that homeostasis. And then if we cut out of homeostasis, that's actually quite dangerous. So living things all have a, a homeostatic range for themselves. The last one is adaptations that to, that um, organisms have to evolve over time. So adaptation is the evolutionary process whereby a population becomes better suited to its habitat. So an example of that is camouflage. You have things such as polar bears and, and snow hares and things like that that live in the polar regions. And you'll note their color is white. That is uh, adaptation that has happened to living in that climate. A non-living thing, such as a rock, again, the rock doesn't change according to where it's living. It doesn't become better adapted. It doesn't need to adapt. It just is there. So you, that's a, a key difference between things that are living and things that are not living. Another example are horses' teeth, that they have large surfaces for grinding grass. And in second semester, we will actually get to uh, look at some fossils of, of horses, which is pretty fun to do. Now, if any of this has gone by too fast, feel free to rewind this, take notes as you need so that you get these. But this wraps up your characteristics of living things.